Oh, I love your vinyl. No, I do the same. <laughs> you can be that guy who matches your kid. Absolutely. Yeah, I did that inadvertently the other day with my kid. I bought him leopard print leggings. <laughs> Annie. Seamus. Thank you so much for joining me here in my home. Um, <laughs> well, we're going to talk about as much of your uh, large, sprawling career uh, and, of course, your debut novel. Uh, but first, can we get started just at the very start? Uh -huh. Childhood. <laughs> Dublin. What was it like back there in Dublin? What were you like as a little, a little nipper? Uh, I don't remember much. I was the youngest, still am, the youngest of four siblings. Um, I was told as a kid that it was a lot of chaos and noise and I slept a lot through it. I, my mum would kind of put me in my like crib up high on the kitchen table so they couldn't reach me and I would just kind of sleep through it a lot. But my memories are of kind of always being surrounded by people and um, yeah, it's very happy memories actually, like just, just, just playing out in, in, the, in, the, in the estate all day. We lived in a housing estate, just play out in the world all day. Um, like loads of, my next door neighbour was my best friend in the world. Like really, <laughs> really idyllic kind of. Sort of allocated at birth. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, good memories of childhood, the ones that have remained anyway. Um, was music something that was kind of already there in the family? It was something you were still Yeah, it was a, kind up? of everywhere, like it was just there. It was just like, we all played music. Um, I did the standard recorder lessons at school, <laughs> but you know, I had two big brothers and a big sister. So, you know, it, it, you're so influenced by them musically. And my brothers were very into traditional Irish music and they played loads of different instruments. My sister was more the kind of Lisa Simpson of the family. She played saxophone in her bedroom most of the time. <laughs> but, um, just slammed the door and yeah, sadly just like, saxed away. Yeah, literally. So, but there was just always music, yeah. And we all played and my mom, my mom is quite musical actually. She had, there's a piano and she used to play that all the time, so. Am I right in thinking you played the mandolin? I played the world? mandolin. What, uh, what kind of a proficiency did you get to? Could you, could you bust Not it out great. now? I could do Losing My Religion by R.E.M. Oh, brilliant. The Water Boys, um, You Saw the, the Hole in the Moon. Of course. There's only three songs in popular culture that contain a mandolin that are in any way good. What was the third one? I'm trying to think what the third one was. It might be a Pogue song. Oh, no, what was that? Anyway, yeah. so yeah. And then I got to kind of teenagerdom like mid-teens and my mandolin teacher at school wanted me to do a performance in assembly and I was like, this is the point that I'm going to duck out because I don't, I, I had to think about what I was doing. I was like, I don't actually want the world to know that I'm a mandolin <laughs> player. I'm going to duck out. Um, so yeah, that was the end of my mandolin career. I had the same thing with flute. Right. I learned the, the sideways flute, the kind of yeah. silver flute, uh, which obviously has connotations if you're growing up as an Irish identifying person in Northern Ireland. Right. Uh, but also if you're bone idol. <laughs> uh, so, and why it's the people, people who teach you flute are also usually people who professionally play jazz, saxophone and clarinet, so right. you can get them off the subject very easily. <laughs> if you can read between the lines what that guy's lifestyle was like <laughs> coming into a primary school. Um, so my family was similar in that we had, my dad wouldn't have been necessarily very musical, but he loved music and he wanted us to learn music. Yeah possibly in the back of his head with the idea of us forming a literal family mm -hmm. band, like yeah. Clannad style. Yeah. Was that ever something? I used something? to say we were like the chorus but ugly, basically. <laughs> oh, that's not Like, true. Um, no, I mean, we all played. We didn't actually play together that much. I used to, I used to play with my eldest brother sometimes. Um, but we, it, was all quite, it, it was all quite separate. We all had our kind of niches within, within the music that we played. Um, and I didn't really start like actually like wanting to write songs until I was like maybe in my 20s and I lived with my brother who was in a band and then that kind of inspired me to write a couple of songs but I never really got further than that. Um, would you say your parents would have an appreciation for the kind of music you ended up sort of broadcasting about and DJing? Would they look at that as being as valuable or would they be like my father and consider it pretty much completely culturally worthless? I don't, you know what, I've never asked, it's a really interesting question, I've never asked what they think about the music and they've never really commented on it, like my dad calls it thump thump music, yeah. as a joke, but maybe partly serious too. Um, they came and saw me play at, what's that festival, is it Longitude in, 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 the, yeah. in, in, in the Republic of Ireland? And they, they like, 
th they had one right by our house. So they all came to see me play there. And that was kind of a big deal because I'd never really thought, like, do they even enjoy? Yeah. And my eldest brother used to come with me to shows in Dublin, like small gigs, and kind of, he used to just stand at the door nervously. People used to think he was security. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my sister's, my sister's into it in a big way, actually. She, she used to listen to pirate radio, and it's through her that I kind of discovered techno and, and kind of dance music as a thing. Uh, yeah, well, talk to me about that. When was the, when was the seed kind of blossoming for you? Was it in your early teens and before that? Well, early teens was different music. It was kind of like, actually, you know, it was probably buying Leftism, the Left Field album, mm. when I was kind of 14, 15. That really was my introduction to, 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 to decent dance music. I had like Massive Attack albums and Blur. I was really into like guitar bands. And then, and then Leftism really just opened opened a lot of doors and then I uh, my first proper clubbing experience was when I was in my final year at school and I went to a place called the Temple of Sound okay yeah pretty legendary club in Dublin and I went with a couple of friends from school and it was just like a light going on in my head like it was just I just remember it really vividly like walking up the road up Georgia Street afterwards my two friends like feeling like you know life had changed as I knew it like it was just it was just uh, I went into this club and there was girls from my school in there that I'd never like didn't really know that well and like we were all best friends Seamus we were dancing on podiums you know the standard like clubbing epiphany it was really that it was the cliche um and that obviously made me want to do more but it was, that was kind of at the end of me being in Dublin and then I moved to Belfast and discovered Shine yeah so I want to talk about that um Belfast obviously comes up in your book. It's yeah. a big part of it. Um, and I hadn't realised that you actually studied in, in, in the North. So was that right. uh, Was that a culture shock for you? I mean, coming from Dublin to Belfast? I mean, mm. maybe people might be surprised that there is such a difference between right. the two places, but was it for you? So my mum is from County Antrim, and all of my childhood was going up and, up, up and down to Northern Ireland. All of our holidays were spent in this kind of farm in, in, in kind of rural Antrim. Um, so I was used to Northern Ireland, but not used to a city in Northern Ireland. Mm. And um, I really liked the idea of going to Queens because that's where my mum went as well. And she suggested going there through clearing because um, I didn't get into the course I wanted to go to in Dublin. So yeah, I just was like, let's, let's give it a lash. And I liked that it was kind of two hours on the Enterprise so like significant <laughs> journey from home to feel like I'm leaving home yeah but still like I could get home by dinner time if I needed to you know yeah. like um and it was it, it wasn't it wasn't a culture shock there was things I was so naive about that I just never had to think about mm. like my my the girl I shared a room with in my halls Ashley Meenan legend <laughs> she's from Derry and um you know, I remember going out initially with her t just down to the pubs, to libraries and like getting smashed at Freshers Week and, and her kind of talking about those questions that you're asked. Mm. What school did you go to? The old classics, you know, to, for people to find out, you know, who you are. And, and, um, and I was really naive about that and I didn't know. And it was interesting for me because I'm Protestant, but I have the name McManus and people assumed that because I was from the south, I was Catholic. Yeah. So she was like, "You're laughing. You can just be either, <laughs> if, according to your mood." You're a double adapter, right? <laughs> yeah. So that was interesting. So oh, oh, no, I'd never had to think about that stuff before. So that was the only real culture shock. It was also just kind of. I always think that that, that the people I met in Belfast, I can't speak for the whole city, and I wouldn't want to, but like, the people I met along the way, where there's a kind of, and Derry, there's a there's a there's a darker shade of black in the humor um like they're wonderfully warm and kind and hilarious but there's a blackness that i'm mm. kind of attracted to really dryness yeah i always think of um i once called up the central library in derry to see if they had like a some sci-fi book i wanted when i was about 10. yeah and i always use this as an example of how just sort of subtly bleakly funny but also paranoid a lot of northern Ireland is. right uh, i asked hi do you have this book uh by harlan Nelson? <laughs> the person on the other phone said, who depends who's asking, you know, <laughs> to, to an 11 year old child. I was like, oh God, um, all right. Um, but there is something about the character of the place that I think maybe even yeah, people from Dublin or people from Cork or Galway might be surprised by. Mm. Um, so it is really interesting to see that, um, 
that, uh, that take from you. Mm -hmm. Whenever you were there and you were experiencing culture then, you mentioned Shine, so can you talk about mm -hmm. how you experienced dance music culture there? So I did English literature as my degree and there was a guy, one of my lecturers actually in English language, it was, it was an English guy called Steve and he worked at Shine, he was just part of the kind of, you know, working with the organisers to make it happen. So I found out about it through him and um, I think they were looking, I don't know why they're looking for work, I don't know. Anyway, he, he, he introduced it, I started going and um, again, like, it was that, that idea of just a kind of very no frills space um, and, and, and kind of making 27 friends in one night <laughs> that were going to be your best friends forever. I was always that person that just kind of ran from person to person and like made friends and I really it, it, like loved that idea of this kind of secret community, this secret club that just was just shine and like you could see people the next day and be like, <laughs> you know, we were there last night. Um, so for me it was as much about the social life initially mm -hmm. and then over the course of working, of, of kind of going there and then getting a job there, working, stamping people's wrists and then getting promoted to the downstairs door of the Mandela Hall and then getting promoted to the door into the green room. <laughs> so like letting, not letting people into the DJs basically and then going and getting the DJs drinks and Being stuff. Being a bouncer effectively. It, it's security. Yeah. So uh, it, felt, it felt more than that at the time, <laughs> Seamus. So yeah, just watching DJs and kind of like, it was kind of, it was a long, slow, gradual, like I always loved the music and, and the culture, but like it was a long, slow kind of love affair into like learning and, and kind of that wonderful thing that music does, which is like that idea of dot joining, you know, where you're like, mm. you just find out more and more and more labels and then and you kind of, it, it just, it felt like infinite in a really exciting way. Well, at this stage, are you still thinking of it as a puncher or are you still think, are you already maybe mixing a little bit doing like mm. it kind of thinking about it professionally thinking about it as an art that you yourself want to get into that wasn't till the end actually so initially it was just raving staying up all night going to after parties in the holy lands it's good um, training yeah yeah and, and kind of you know getting to know the music and then i started buying records um from charity shops mainly because i was skint um and it wasn't until my final year there i would have been 19 20 maybe, um, that I bought a set of decks off my friend Mickey Murphy. So I lived with five girls, or four girls, and, and a boy at the end. But all of my shine friends were really separate, and they were a big group of guys who lived further down the road on uh, Malone Avenue. And um, I would just, uh, there was just like, there was maybe like, you know, six of them, and it was just me and all of them, and we used to just talk about music all the time and play poker. and. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was one of them, Mickey, that sold me his decks and a big box of records. And then I spent the last, my last summer in Belfast, not knowing where I was going to go. Like, I was trying to get into some BBC course in BBC Northern Ireland about radio. I was trying to get a job at Cool FM. Oh, really? I decided I wanted to do radio at that point. It was kind of like, how do I stay here? And it was that summer that I, like, that I learned how to mix. I taught myself how to mix. Um, I mean, you mentioned radio then as well. I mean. It seems pretty striking that you, I think you, you said that your first show on radio was, you were 26 on Radio 1? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an incredible achievement, but it's also an awful lot of responsibility. I mean, was it sort of scary or stressful or something you had to really work hard at getting, getting mm. better at? Or did mm. you kind of take to it like a duck to water? Well, there was kind of two years behind the scenes, which was very, inc well, incredibly valuable for me in terms of, no, it not feeling scary or alien because I knew everyone in there. I knew how a radio show worked. I'd, I'd worked as an assistant producer or what we called a broadcast assistant back in those days. Um, so I knew the kind of me mechanics of it. And when you know what a show is supposed to do and you know who, what everyone's role is and how they're supposed to work and what they're supposed to bring to the show, there's a lot, it just, it, it's much easier to, to kind of feel like in control of it. Um, and it was all I wanted, so it wasn't, it, it, it kind of, it, it felt pretty fluid, to be mm. honest. It wasn't like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because I had been doing it in other places, smaller places. Um, so I had experience as a presenter. But yeah, I mean, like, I'll never forget the first link and, and the feeling of, like, 
object figure. <laughs> when the red light goes on. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. At this point, you're DJing out more as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, very are amateur. Are completely in parallel at the same time? No. So, so I got the show. I was DJing like I was, I was your favorite house party DJ. Like I'd rock up and DJ anyone's house party. And then <laughs> I got this gig. I, again, I live with my brother's band. So they got me, they knew someone who ran the Underworld, which is a, a kind of infamous like basement club in Camden. And I got, a sh I got a gig there, like playing everything, like Dizzy Rascal and Guns N' Roses, like <coughs> it, it, not, that, not, not mixing really, just like playing anything to keep a dance floor full. Um, but it was cool and it felt good to do that. Um, it wasn't really until I got the radio show playing dance music that the dance music bookings came in. And one of the first clubs to book me actually was Shine. And I remember oh. being really scared about that, about wanting to feel like, you know, I could do it for them and do, you know, do them justice in booking me. Um, but there was, a, there was about a year of, of, of you know, that, that was the bit that felt alien and scary, the DJ gigs, to be honest, not, not the radio. Really? So I think a lot of people might find the radio more scary. Mm. I don't know, talking. For me, it's the performative going. aspect. It's yeah. DJing. It, like, I've always found that hard, which is probably why I was drunk for 15 years. <laughs> but it's kind of like it's playing in front of people, which is weird because I really wanted to be an actor. So the idea, like, I, I don't know. I thought maybe that would come naturally to me more, like playing in front of people. But it's more just the it's 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 DJing in front of people with nothing to give apart from my mm. music. You know, you also get live feedback from them if they're not enjoying it, it's very hard for you not to realise that they're oh, not yeah. enjoying it. Oh yeah, and you always, you always <laughs> fixate on the one person who's looking at their phone. I mean, yeah. like, why? Mm -hmm. um, so I found out hard, like I remember my boyfriend at the time coming with me and being like, fucking smile. <laughs> like whispering from behind the curtains and me being like, I can't because I have to mix and I have to take this really seriously. And, being like, and I used to write my sets on a piece of paper and have it sat there. Exactly what I was going to write. I did that as well. Like oh a my little nerd. God, yeah. I remember a set, like, in, in, I think it was in Newcastle, and Ali from Tief Schwartz, he, he was there, and he was in a quite an interesting state of mind. <laughs> and he was like curled up, curled up in a big like bass bin, right, like part of my like oh booth my speaker, like like this for the whole set. And I was like, hello, with my little piece of paper and my thing, and I was like, my vinyl. Like <laughs> this guy was like out of it. Um, Just need to upload my spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, it wasn't fun. It was too scary to be fun back in the day. And then obviously afterwards, I'd have the best time ever. I mean, how long was that learning curve, though? I, I was a very nervous performer pretty much forever. I think yeah. I find it very difficult. But yeah. when, uh, talking to people, I don't find as nervous. Though. Yeah, so we're the same. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's like there's certain things come come naturally. But the, like, I always talk about this, and it's hard to t articulate it without sounding like like I'm being kind of denigrating DJing because I'm not like it's an art form it's it's you know it, it, I, I respect it and I love it but there is something absurd about it yeah um, and, and I mean that about the performative aspect not about the actual process of DJing and making a journey of music and making people dance it's people staring at you <coughs> while you do it that's a bit absurd yeah and, everyone's and somewhere along the way that, that wasn't a thing as we know you know it used to you know People used to just do it in the corner and not really be looked at that much. Well, I think that was originally the idea behind Boiler Room, wasn't it? Was that you, mm. the DJ had his back to the to the thing? It was it was, but then that well, that's totally turned on its head. <laughs> it is. It literally and figuratively changed, turned 180 degrees. Right. Years. Yeah. Um, I mean, we mentioned about careers that are parts of uh, creative careers that are easier for some people or harder for some people. Um, you have written a book, uh, having studied literature. Was this something that you definitely had kind of your sights on? Was this something you were doing? Were you that voracious reading mm. bookie kid uh, as a child? Yeah, so always read. Um, was just, again, like music standard. My mom was an English teacher. There was loads and loads of books. We used to go to the library every week. So it was just, just, just very normal to, to, to be reading lots of books. and. I didn't, I, I didn't collect them in the way that you'd kind of collect records or something. It was always like read and pass on, read mm. and pass on. Um, and I've been thinking a lot since writing this book and talking about it, about why I didn't want to write more in college. But I think I was so kind of starry-eyed about music and the kind of social life and the community that came with that and wanting to kind of go to London and do radio. That writing just, like, I loved it. I wrote poetry in college. I always wrote journals. So writing, again, was just part of my existence. 
it was part of like a private way of expressing myself and documenting my life, but I never thought about it doing it professionally. I'd kind of started books for the laugh and then stopped after two pages a few times. Yeah. But it, it wasn't really something that kind of dominated my ambition at all. It's also, it's very lonely, quite tedious work. It doesn't I have mean, the instant feedback. It doesn't have those. Right. It has definitely highs and lows, but it, it's, it is, it's quite solitary and... I think I needed to get the other bit out of my system first, really. I think you did it in the right order. Mm. <laughs> I, think. I think a lot of... I, I've kind of heard that a lot of people start writing in their 40s. Um, mm. A lot of women especially. So, yeah, I, I get it. As someone who's in their 40s, I understand why you, you'd come to that now. Um, well, to talk about the book uh, specifically, uh, which I've read, and right. really enjoyed, was very moved by. Um, it's set in Belfast. Mm. Uh, I'll not talk too much about the exact plot. Um, you're welcome to give a brief synopsis if you like. Um, but why Belfast? Good question. Mm. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I kind of started writing. There was no plan, no plot, no strategy, no agenda. It was just write. I just want to write. I, I, I turned 40. I wanted to do a writing course to kind of force myself to have some discipline. And in order to do the writing course, you had to submit a piece of writing. So I wrote a scene. And the scene was this young fella stumbling out of what was shine, but it's not written in a shine, um, and kind of stumbling across the road, University Road, to the front bit of Queens and kind of having quite a trippy, you know, hallucinogenic moment where he sees lights and thinks they're really beautiful, but they're actually the blue and red police car lights, you know, uh, uh, the headlights, and the thing on top of the car, sorry. So, um, that was an autobiographical scene that happened to me in real life and I kind of wrote that as him and that's just the first thing that came out of me and everything kind of spider webbed out from there but like looking back I do think that Queen's you know from my, my those three years in Belfast were so transformative for me mm. in terms of growing up learning about who I was learning about who, who I wanted to, to be um, kind of just they, they really were, they were so important, so it doesn't surprise me that like my unconscious went there, if you know yeah. what I mean. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, especially if you're having such a massive awakening of something uh, right. in a place, it can come back. I mean, as I said, I, the book, I did find the book very moving, uh, and the way that it talks about so many things, uh, like, you know, motherhood, loss, mm. grief, addiction, um, but it, it's about, you said, I, I believe that it's about the resilience uh, of women as well, mm. uh, which I really took from it. It's also about the forced, the, uh, not forced, but the presumed labour of women. Um, mm. and I just, I th could you talk about that a little bit in terms of the, the characters and the things they have to do just because society tells them they have to or their families tell them they have mm. to? Yeah, so I mean, it, Mary is, you know, you, you meet her when she's nine years old. And the book kind of zooms in on her life at various periods of her growing up. And there is, um, you know, yeah, this, this assumed role that she takes. She lives with a useless dad uh, and, and uh, you know, dad who's kind of stricken and broken by grief and, and a brother. And it, it's, it's kind of decided from the very start that she is the one who has to keep house. Mm. Um, and she never questions it because that's all she knows. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of write about th those assumptions and uh, the kind of extra burdens that, that women have to get through just, just, to, just to succeed in anything. There's kind of a lot of assumed roles. Um, it's changing, obviously, but you know, in a traditional household like that, um, that's just what it was for her. And her whole life was that, really. It was just give, 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 give. Yeah. There was no taking. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think you mentioned in an interview with Krishna Gurumurti about your DJing career actually would have basically had to stall after you had kids because right. just logistically, the, the industry is not set up to support someone. And that's a choice. Mm. And can you talk to me about that choice that you described where you were like, well, I can't, I can't actually do my job. Yeah. in that way anymore? I mean, I have memories of DJing. I DJed up to being kind of seven months pregnant, maybe maybe even eight. No, maybe not eight, seven. And I remember playing in, in like a warehouse in Leeds 
and kind of feeling the baby kick um, and being like, is this okay? Are you happy about this or sad? I can't, are you, are you dancing or <laughs> protesting? Um, are you the neighbor in the next, yeah, the, the next apartment? I remember looking up like, um, Googling like, you know, people who work in factories with really loud noise who are mm. pregnant. Like what, what is the kind of, there's no rules. I don't really know what the rules are of me doing this. Is it okay to be around music like this? Is it okay to be around like a, a bass bin that is this loud and this close? Um, so there was a kind of fear in, in, in kind of the unknown of like, am I doing the right thing? That I also felt a really immense pressure to keep doing it mm. because no one else was. And yeah. I wanted to prove that. I was well, like, yeah, I can, you said that. I can do this. Yeah, you said that you didn't have any peers who had, uh, female peers who had kids. No. And then I was just doing a mental inventory. I was like, oh my God, could that be right? That's appalling. Yeah. I mean, it's actually appalling. Yeah, um, a lot of male peers, peers. Yeah, and and I kind of watched them and how they worked, and you know they would still be going on tour to Australia or America, but they just bring. Sometimes they bring their kids. Most of the time, they leave them at home with their wife or their partner, um, and that wasn't an option for me because I, I didn't really want to bring my kids on tour, to be honest. But also, um, <laughs> my my husband also had a job. You know, he, he, mm. he, and he wasn't willing to sacrifice two weeks of his work to come, <laughs> to come to Australia with me and look after a baby. That wasn't what he wanted to do, and I respect that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was an element of, there was an element of, of kind of, I can't do this. And then afterwards, uh, I mean, I played Love Box after six weeks of having my first kid. And I look back at that now, and I'm a bit like, Jesus, uh, I wasn't really ready to do that. But I did. And again, a lot of having a baby is not knowing how you're going to feel. And it's not knowing, um, not be, and, and DJing, you work very far ahead. So you have to book a gig eight months up front. And you, I, I just genuinely don't know if I'm going to want to do this or if I'm going to be able to do this. Um, so it, it's hard. Yeah, I, found it, I found it hard. And then with my first kid, I charged through, kept going. And then the reality of being a parent, and you know, this isn't a gender thing at all, it's just, a fucking sleep thing <laughs> of like getting in at six in the morning and your kid waking up at seven and needing you. That's yeah. relentless and hard. And, and that kind of coincided with me getting this show on the, the Future Sounds show that I do on Radio One, which was every evening. And, and that was attractive to me because it was secure. It was in one place. It was my dream radio job. A, a brilliant show to, to get to do. When you're yeah, so doing, so so doing that was like, okay, I can be a parent and do this. But then I was still DJing at the weekends, so my kids got older and it was like, well, you're just never here because mm -hmm. you're not there in the evenings, you're not there on the weekends. So it was like, okay, it's, something has to give here. And I chose the safe option and kind of took less gigs. I mean, I still DJ, but I, I definitely like that, that touring DJing, that, that kind of going around, doing your... Australian tours, doing your Ibiza residencies, that stopped them. And I also, made that choice. Also in dance music, because it's so, <clears throat> I suppose one could say fickle, but it's very based on the now. Right. If you lose that momentum, it's very hard to get back. Even if you were to kind of get everything else there, you can't, you don't get the offers that you were going to get, say, whenever you were doing right. it every week. Right. Um, can I talk to you about that show um, and your decision recently to sure. say goodbye? Yeah. Um, it took a took few, few of us by surprise. Can you talk about why it was the right time? I think you, the phrase you used, which I really liked, was you know, leaving when the party is still you yeah. know, jumping. <laughs> so, As my friend Sarah Cox pointed out, Annie, you've never done that in your life. <laughs> You're always the last to leave. And I was like, this can be the one. <laughs> this can be the one. So can you, can you talk about that? I mean, was it a wrench? Was it a thing that you're like, no, this is good. I feel good about doing this now. What's, it's really the latter. So there's a real feeling of peace. And it, do you know what? It feels really nice um, to feel like that about it. Um, there's a kind of feeling of steering my own ship in a nice way and kind of making choices that are working for me. Um, I had been thinking about it for a while because Radio 1, it, it, you know, it's a youth radio station. And it, it's a lot like DJing, you know, everyone else stays the same age, but you grow older. <laughs> And it's um, at some point, you know, I was always conscious of wanting to move on anyway. It was just a matter of when. Um, my youngest kid starts school in September, so that felt like a really easy kind of point to, to kind of focus towards. 
because with my oldest son, I hadn't really been around in the evenings for him, for dinner, for bedtime, for like six years. It's all he kind of knew, and I, I kind of wanted to do it differently this time. So there's that. Um, and then there was like, it was kind of a confluence of things. Then I, t I turned 40, I wrote that, I did the podcast, and it was kind of this realization that there is other things that I can mm. do on my time and my terms that are feasible, you know, career strands. Uh, it doesn't all have to be DJing and radio. So that was quite exciting to me. I quite liked the idea of trying new stuff, owning what I did, um, and just not having to be somewhere yeah. for anyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and have that. I suppose the, the sort of golden handcuff of having such a great show that's so well liked and listened to, but also it's, it's always there. It's always kind of, yeah. it's the, you know, whatever the 6 a.m. call or whatever it is, I think a lot of people could find that quite restricting as well as comforting. It's right. I, and you know what was weird is that it wasn't until I made the decision, put it out there, that I that it occurred to me, like, God, in September, I don't have to do... I could, <laughs> I could go away for like six months. I could do whatever I want. And I've never had that. You know, anyone with a full-time job, you know, you don't have that. You're kind of beholden to that. So I found that really exciting, the kind of freedom of it. And there is things I miss and I'm fully expecting to have serious FOMO about certain things and mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of having a word with myself. I'm gonna miss like having a bit of a purpose, like in the pandemic especially. It was really nice just to feel like I had a purpose and I had somewhere to go every day and a team to work with. Yeah. I'm gonna miss the connection aspect. I'm gonna really miss talking to artists. I love talking to young people at Radio 1 and I, I talk to like amazingly talented, passionate, you know, teenagers, kids in their early 20s and it's it's so inspiring so I'll miss that but I mean I, I think it's important to say that I'm not I have no intention of leaving radio period mm. it's just that slot I, it, it you know isn't sustainable so it's just waiting around taking a break which I think is really important getting some perspective for the first time ever and then coming back to radio and another time um, will this break and the opportunities it affords include Maybe another book? Correct. Have you already started, finished, gotten through it? What's started. Okay. I had a period probably of can't tell us anything, frenzied, but please tell us everything. Yeah, I had a period of frenzied writing over Christmas, which was kind of reactionary to that. So it was like everything that's not in that. I'm writing more about what I know. I'm writing, uh, I, I said it in one year, rather than fucking back and forth <laughs> decades. I, I said it down the road for me in London so I don't have to get on the plane every time I want to see something uh, in the book. Um, and yeah, it's kind of very, as I said, very loosely autobiographical. So it's, it's at the moment, I mean, I shouldn't even be saying it because I, don't, I haven't even finished a draft, <laughs> but it, it's kind of coming of age, young girl moves from Ireland to London. It's that vibe. Um, well, that dovetails lovely with my next question, which is as someone from Ireland, who has moved to London, uh, mm. like yourself, uh, I've heard you say something which really rings true to me, is this idea of almost becoming like an ambassador for Ireland or feeling more Irish because I'm elsewhere. And for me being Northern Irish, it's kind of, it's double because you know there's two competing things that people might think they know about the place. Mm. Um, do you still feel that? Do you still feel like you're an ambassador or that you're a representative of the diaspora? I don't. You really don't? Yeah, which is bad, isn't it? No, that's... Part, but it, it, part of me feels like I'm so entrenched into British culture now that people, I don't know, don't, I, I, I don't feel like people think of me as being Irish as much as I would like. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I sometimes have to remind people um, that I'm Irish. So I think I need to do some work on that. Maybe from an Irish perspective, there is that more. I feel it like I do work with other voices, that wonderful TV show in Ireland. And I feel it from... From, from people like that, you know, I feel from a music perspective that people um, enjoy the fact that I support Irish music and that means a lot to me to play it and uplift it as much as I can. But yeah, I kind of, I'm that annoying person that's like, I'm Irish, don't forget it. Um, so yeah. Uh, are you like that with your kids as well? Always. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I called my kid a really Irish name, that's which he I hate me for, but... Um, <laughs> I always say to him, remember you're half Irish, it's very important. And he goes, I'm half English too. And I'm like, yeah, but the half Irish bit's more important. Yeah, we have these conversations at home, whether, okay, maybe 
maybe he can support England in football, but Ireland in rugby, or you know, we make these little gambles <laughs> and bet. Compromise. Yeah, uh, and it is funny because I, I feel so much more attuned with Irishness, but as you say, feeling like an ambassador would be putting it too strong, but I definitely feel more yeah, I feel more Irish the longer I'm away. I wonder yeah, if I move cl- back, you cling would it on be? To it. Yeah. Because if I move back, it wouldn't be the special thing about me. No, I mean, you go to any Irish pub over here and you see the kind of, the owl fellas at the bar kind of staring into their pints all like misty-eyed and nostalgic about Ireland. And like, I get it. Like, you know, you kind of cling on to those memories and they, they're what make you, you. You know, they're, 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 they are your your makeup and when you go away you need to be able to remember who you are or else you get a bit lost don't you so i understand why i that's why i do it anyway I, it means so much to me to be irish could you ever see yourself pitching back up in some cottage somewhere out in the west yeah i've thought about that especially <laughs> in the last year because you can't get home to see my family and it's mm. like hang on a second like this isn't I didn't, this isn't, I didn't bargain for this. Like, I, I want to be able to get on a Ryanair flight and be home in 50 minutes. <laughs> um, so I got a bit panicked with that. I was like, hmm, am I in the right place? Is this where I want to be? And, you know, you rethink your choices. But I'm hoping that once the pandemic's over and we can travel again, I'll, that will go. Um, you know, again, the idea of being free from, from not that I was trapped, but that free from doing the radio show every day is quite exciting because yeah. you could go over there and spend a load of time there. Um, I'm quite excited about the idea of my kids having an Irish accent as well. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Just pulling them around the whole country in a caravan. Mm-hmm. I always say that to people, it's like only about four hours long. Yeah. Um, th- that's us reached time. Um, thank you so much for chatting to me. I really love the book and everyone should read it. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you, Seamus. Thank you. I like that it's the Irish colours as well, orange, green and white. That was, Emmett said that to me the second I walked in.